Chapter 2. Is Happiness All That Matters? You probably already knew this, but just in case you didn't, no philosophical theory worth its salt is free of difficulties. As a result, you aren't going to get in this chapter or any others a decisive knockdown argument for one theory or another. Brilliant minds have developed the theories we consider in this book, and equally brilliant minds have failed to climb on board. So it should come as no surprise that hedonism, a perennial contender for best theory of human welfare, should also have its critics. They have been busy. Here are the major concerns that they have identified. The paradox of hedonism. If something always makes us better off, then it seems reasonable to try very hard to acquire it. With happiness, however, this completely backfires. Those who try really hard to make themselves happier almost never succeed. Philosophers call this the paradox of hedonism. The paradox reminds me of an embarrassing poster I had hanging on my bedroom wall as a child. It showed a butterfly and not far away a man sitting in a meadow. The caption read, happiness is like a butterfly. The more you pursue it, the more it eludes you. Be still and let it come to you. We can use this distressing vignette to develop an argument against hedonism. Let's call it the paradox of hedonism argument. 1. If happiness is the only thing that directly makes us better off, then it is rational to single-mindedly pursue it. 2. It isn't rational to do that. 3. Therefore, happiness isn't the only thing that directly makes us better off. This argument is valid. Its logic is perfect. If both premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. But we also need to know whether both premises really are true. If they are, then hedonism is sunk. I think the second premise is pretty plausible. The icky sentiment on my childhood poster is correct. Those who seek only happiness and fixate on acquiring it are bound to be disappointed. Aiming directly for happiness is not the best way to get it. You'd do far better to seek a partner you love and respect, to develop an exciting hobby, or to find a career you can be proud of. Doing any of these things is a much surer route to happiness. So the second premise looks good. And the first premise also seems plausible. If happiness is really the only thing that is valuable in its own right, then you should go for it. But this premise is suspect, precisely because the direct pursuit of good things sometimes prevents us from getting them. Think of the professional golfer in the midst of a slump. She desperately wants to regain her swing, but the more she focuses on this, the harder it becomes. Or consider the immature student who wants more than anything to be well-liked and so tries way too eagerly and very annoyingly to be pals with his classmates. Such behavior is self-defeating. He'd be much better off trying less hard. The bottom line is that even if happiness is our greatest good, it may be irrational to aim for it directly. And if that is so, then premise one is false. As a result, the paradox we've just considered, while surprising, does not pose a serious threat to hedonism. It doesn't challenge the idea that happiness is the only thing of intrinsic value. It just tells us that aiming directly for happiness is not a smart way to get it. Evil Pleasures Some people take great delight in doing the most awful things. Think of supposed friends who tempt others into addiction, or a powerful boss who betrays a vulnerable employee. These tawdry people may really be enjoying themselves, but when such enjoyment comes at someone else's expense, it hardly seems a good thing, much less the best thing. We can build another anti-hedonist argument around this point. Call it the argument from evil pleasures. 1. If hedonism is true, then happiness that comes from evil deeds is as good as happiness that comes from kind and decent actions. 2. Happiness that comes from evil deeds is not as good as happiness that comes from kind and decent actions. 3. Therefore, hedonism is false. This argument fails, and it's instructive to see why. There is a confusion contained within it, and it's one that is easy to make. When we say that happiness that comes from one source is as good as happiness from any other source, we might mean that each is morally equivalent to the other. When we read premise two and nod our heads approvingly, this is probably what we have in mind. But this is not what hedonists have in mind. They don't think that each episode of happiness is as morally good as every other. Rather, they think that the same amount of happiness, no matter its source, is equally beneficial. According to hedonism, happiness gained from evil deeds can improve our lives just as much as happiness that comes from virtue. 
In this sense, happiness derived from evil deeds is as good as happiness that comes from virtue. Each can contribute to our well-being just as much as the other. Hedonists, therefore, reject premise two. And aren't they right to do so? Think about why the happiness of the wicked is so upsetting. Isn't it precisely because happiness benefits them and we hate to see the wicked prosper? If happiness doesn't make us better off, why is it so awful when the wicked enjoy the harms they cause? And for those who share my vengeful streak, why is it gratifying to see the wicked suffer? Because misery always cuts into our well-being, and we think it right that the wicked pay for their crimes. Hedonism makes perfect sense of these feelings. The Two Worlds Within philosophical circles, one of the most famous objections to hedonism originated with W.D. Ross, a British philosopher whose ethical theory is discussed in Chapter 16. Ross invited us to consider two worlds that contain identical amounts of happiness and misery. In one of these, the people are all virtuous. In the other, they are all vicious. Hedonism tells us that these worlds are equally good. No one believes this. Ross anticipates the hedonist's response. Virtuous people are those who reliably make others happy, while vicious people tend to make others miserable. So the situation we are being asked to imagine is impossible. The virtuous world would contain a lot more happiness than the vicious one. Ross will have none of this. There are non-human sources of happiness and misery, such as disease. So imagine, in the virtuous world, that its extra happiness is offset by greater misery resulting from disease. Still, the virtuous world is better than the vicious one. Ross thinks that this thought experiment allows us to see that virtue is good in its own right, wholly apart from any happiness it brings about. Since hedonism rejects this, hedonism is mistaken. We can turn Ross's objection into an argument. Call it the two worlds argument. One, if hedonism is true, then any two situations containing identical amounts of happiness and unhappiness are equally good. Two, some such situations are not equally good. Some are better than others. Three, therefore hedonism is false. I think that Ross is right about premise two. It is better that virtue and not vice be rewarded by happiness. Even if virtue is its own reward, it is better that it be rewarded by happiness as well. And if we have to choose, it is far better that good people be happy than that bad people enjoy themselves. So even if good and bad people are equally enjoying themselves, the situations may not be equally good. The second premise, then, is actually pretty plausible. But hedonists can reject the first. Their view is not about what makes a situation or a world good, but rather about what makes a life good for the person who lives it. Hedonism, as it stands, doesn't tell us how to determine the value of a world, and so it is not committed to the view that two worlds containing equal amounts of happiness must be equally good. Hedonism does not try to tell us about every way in which things can be good or bad. It tells us only about what directly makes us better off. So long as hedonists do not say that the only value is individual welfare, they can easily allow that such things as biodiversity, beautiful objects, and morally admirable actions add to the overall value of a world. Thus, hedonists can and should reject the first premise of the two worlds argument. False happiness. Imagine a woman who is happy in her marriage partly because she trusts her husband and believes that he has been completely faithful. Suppose her belief is true. Now imagine another woman who is as happy as the first and for the same reasons, but in this case her belief is false. Her husband has been cheating on her without her knowledge. It seems that the first woman's life is going better for her, and yet these two women are equally happy. This story provides us with the basis of an argument from false happiness. 1. If hedonism is true, then our lives go well to the extent that we are happy. 2. It's not the case that our lives go well to the extent that we are happy. Those whose happiness is based on false beliefs have worse lives than those whose happiness is based on true beliefs, even if both lives are equally happy. 3. Therefore, hedonism is false. This is in one way like the argument from evil pleasures, since both claim that the source of happiness determines how beneficial that happiness is. Critics say that if happiness comes from an immoral action or false belief, 
then it makes us less well off than otherwise. Hedonists deny this. Happiness is happiness, regardless of its source, so hedonists must reject the second premise. But it is harder to do so here when it comes to false beliefs. The late Harvard philosopher Robert Nozick tried to show this in a thought experiment involving an experience machine. Imagine that there is an amazing virtual reality machine that lets you simulate any experience you like. Suppose you program it for a lifetime of the very best experiences. Once you plug in, you think that you are in the real world and have no memory of life outside the machine. Your entire life from then on is lived in the machine and you are as happy as can be, believing yourself to be doing all of the things you truly enjoy. Compare this with a case in which someone actually does the things and enjoys the experiences that the plugged-in person only dreams of. It seems clear that the second life, the real one, is more desirable, yet both lives contain the same amount of happiness. This is meant to show that happiness is not the sole element of well-being. A good life is one that is happy, yes, but not only that. Our happiness must be based in reality. A pleasant life of illusion is less good for you than an equally pleasant life based on real achievement and true beliefs. The Importance of Autonomy one of the other things we want from life is to make our own choices about it. We resent it when other people manipulate us, even if they mean well. Sometimes we even prefer the definite prospect of sadness to a more pleasant life that is forced upon us without our consent. In short, we want autonomy. The power to guide our life through our own free choices, even if it sometimes costs us our happiness. Not only do we want autonomy, but we also think that a life without it cannot be fully good. Consider the inhabitants of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Huxley created a fictional society in which war, poverty, and emotional distress have all disappeared. How have such things been achieved? The rulers have introduced a pacifying drug called Soma, which all citizens must take. Books and shows that may upset people have been banned. Close relationships are forbidden so as to prevent the heartache that comes from the loss of a friendship or a loved one. Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Not in this society. The citizens of this brave new world have become complacent animals, obedient to the political masters who are intent on manipulating them. Though this society might well be a happier one than ours, it seems clear that something valuable is missing. That something is autonomy. We don't need to seek out imaginary tales to appreciate the importance of autonomy to a good life. When we go to the doctor's office, we don't want to be lied to, even if we would be happier were we deceived. Many dying patients turn down the offer of pain medication because it can interfere with their ability to make rational decisions. Such patients prefer to face their end in a clear-eyed way, even if it means that they are more miserable as a result. Autonomous choices don't always lead to happiness. Things go wrong. We make free choices that lead to damaged relationships, financial disaster, missed opportunities. Still, we need only imagine a life without autonomy to see what a tragedy it would be. Read the reports of Soviet psychiatrists who systematically drugged and tortured critics of the regime. Many of these critics went insane. Others were reduced to bowing and scraping before their white-coated masters. These doctors caused appalling unhappiness, but that is not the only harm they did to their victims, and in some cases it is not the worst of the damage done. Even if the drugs had kept the dissidents happy, the actions of these doctors would still have been a horrendous crime because of the way in which they tried to crush the independence of their victims. A searing picture of how the loss of autonomy undermines well-being can be found at the conclusion of Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Its hero, R.P. McMurphy, is a free spirit with contempt for rules and for the authorities who enforce them. McMurphy is committed to a mental institution and slowly broken, eventually being forced to submit to a lobotomy that leaves him an empty shell. Recall Foote's anecdote of the previous chapter. That this is all supposedly done for his own good only makes the tragedy greater. At the end, he may be happier, having at this point only a childlike capacity to understand the world, but it hardly seems that he is better off as a result. And the explanation is simple. Preserving our autonomy is vitally important, even if it doesn't always make us happier. It's a good thing to be able to exercise autonomous choice, and this explains what is objectionable about paternalism. 
someone's limiting your liberty against your will, but for your own good. A society of arranged marriages, forced career choices, anti-gambling legislation, and motorcycle helmet laws might lead to greater happiness. In some cases, these restrictions might really be justified. And yet even so, there is something to regret. We lose the opportunity to take chances, to risk our happiness, to exercise real freedom. Manipulation and paternalism, even when done in a way that gains us happiness, are still objectionable to some extent. And that is because they sacrifice something of intrinsic value, autonomy. Happiness is not the only thing that is important in its own right. Autonomy is, too. Here we have the makings of another argument against hedonism. Call this the argument from autonomy. 1. If hedonism is true, then autonomy contributes to a good life only insofar as it makes us happy. 2. Autonomy sometimes directly contributes to a good life even when it fails to make us happy. 3. Therefore, hedonism is false. The first premise is clearly true. The central claim of hedonism is that happiness is the only thing in itself that makes us better off. All other things, e.g. autonomy, virtue, true knowledge, improve our lives only to the extent that they make us happier. So everything hinges on the second premise. It seems plausible. When we consider the lives of those who have been deprived of their autonomy, we see the absence of a great value, something that by itself appears to make a life a better one. Given a choice between drug-induced contentment and plotting our own risky course through life, we prefer the latter path. We want our lives to be authentic, to reflect our own values rather than those imposed on us from the outside, even if we are not always happier as a result. Hedonism cannot account for that. Life's Trajectory if hedonism is true, then those whose lives contain the same amount of happiness and unhappiness must be equally well off. But this seems false. Consider the sad case of Delmore Schwartz, a brilliant writer and conversationalist who served as the basis of the title character in Saul Bellow's novel Humboldt's Gift. Schwartz earned many awards early in his career and taught at Princeton and Harvard for several years. But his last decade was spent in increasing frustration and isolation addicted to alcohol and drugs and experiencing increasingly severe paranoia and mental illness, he died alone in a seedy hotel in Times Square, the promise of his early years left unfulfilled. It is impossible to say just how much happiness and sadness filled Schwartz's life. But imagine a person whose early life was all heartache and hardship. Jane Eyre or Oliver Twist, for example. Or from real life, perhaps someone like Mary Carr, whose terrific memoir, The Liars Club, portrays a childhood about as miserable as can be. In such lives, the suffering eventually yields to happiness and many years of satisfaction and pleasure. When we compare lives with such different trajectories, it is hard to resist the thought that a life that begins badly but continually improves is better than a life that starts out with a bang and goes slowly, steadily downhill, even if there is no difference in the total amounts of happiness contained in each life. We can fashion this thought into the trajectory argument. 1. If hedonism is true, then the overall quality of a life depends entirely on the amount of happiness and unhappiness it contains. 2. The overall quality of life depends on at least one other factor, whether one's life reflects an upward or downward trajectory. 3. Therefore, hedonism is false. To make this criticism stick, we need to be sure that we are not sneaking in extra happiness on the part of the fortunate person whose life ends better than it began. The total happiness and unhappiness within the lives being compared must be the same. The only difference must be in the timing of the happiness and misery. If we take care to respect this requirement, I think we still feel that equal amounts of happiness and misery may not yield lives of equal well-being. If that is so, then something other than happiness and misery determines how good a life is. In this case, it is not autonomy, but rather the shape of a life. Continual improvement makes for a better life than one that has long been sliding downhill, even if both lives contain the same amounts of happiness and misery. Unhappiness as a symptom of harm. Consider an Olympic marathon runner who is poised to bring home gold. She has trained for years for this event. Suppose that she pulls a hamstring the day before the race and is unable to compete. All that work to no end. She's devastated. Why does this reaction make sense? It seems well explained if we assume that the development of our talents is important in its own right. 
this athlete sees that something terrible has happened, and that is why she is unhappy. What's most regrettable in her case isn't her unhappiness, it's the destruction of her talents. After all, would everything be fine if someone slipped her a Soma pill? When is it rational to feel miserable about how your life is going? Simple, when something really bad happens to you. On the face of it, this can include a huge number of things. Losing a leg in a car accident, being jilted by someone you love, missing the opportunity of a lifetime, etc. Each of these rightly causes great sadness. If hedonism is correct, however, this short list and the much longer one we could undoubtedly put together are basically mistaken. For there is only one truly bad thing that can happen to you, and that is to experience sadness. Things can harm you only if they cause you to be unhappy. If hedonism is true, then as long as we remain alive and greet each day happily, our lives cannot go badly. A stiff upper lip, or a soma pill, or genuine indifference, is enough to protect against harm. So, for those who want to be immune from harm, here is the recipe. They must become either emotionally blank or permanently upbeat. Those who are never sad are never harmed. Their talents might go to waste, their limbs might atrophy, their senses deaden, friendships break, curiosity dim. If hedonism is correct, none of this will undermine their well-being so long as they are not saddened by it. Perhaps unhappiness always makes us worse off, but other things might do so as well. Consider how reasonable it is to be saddened, say, at a failed chance at love or at the death of a dear friend. Such things diminish our happiness. But they do so only because our happiness in these and so many other cases depends on our appreciating what has value in its own right. If loving relationships didn't by themselves make us better off, it wouldn't be so clear that their loss is our loss. We mourn because we have been deprived of someone whose presence has directly made our lives richer. Hedonism runs into trouble when trying to account for this. Here is an argument that shows how. Call it the argument from multiple harms. 1. If hedonism is true, then you can be harmed by something only because it saddens you. 2. You can be harmed in other ways. 3. Therefore, hedonism is false. The first premise is clearly true, and the second also seems plausible. Tragedies don't disappear just because their victims are reconciled to them. The unhappiness we experience is bad for us but it can also be a symptom of the loss of something that all by itself matters to our well-being. Our misery in such situations is evidence that things other than happiness can directly make a difference to our well-being. If that is so, then hedonism is mistaken. Conclusion Hedonism has always had its fans. And, as we have seen, there are many good reasons for its popularity. It explains why there are many paths to a good life. It strikes a balance between a view that imposes just one blueprint of a good life and a view that allows anything to be valuable so long as you think it is. It provides a ready explanation for why misery so clearly damages a life and why happiness so clearly improves it. Hedonism offers a natural stopping point for explaining what is intrinsically valuable. It accounts for why the rules of a good life allow for exceptions, and happiness is what we want for our loved ones. What better evidence that happiness truly contributes to a good life? And yet, hedonism is not problem-free. I think that hedonists have good replies to the paradox of hedonism, the worry about evil pleasures, and Ross's two worlds objections. But things become trickier when we consider the value of a happiness that is based on false beliefs. Further, hedonists cannot allow for the intrinsic value of autonomy. They can't make sense of the idea that of two lives containing the same amount of happiness, the one that continually shows improvement is better than the one that has gone steadily downhill. Hedonists also fail to appreciate that unhappiness is often a symptom that something intrinsically valuable, something other than happiness, has been lost. Perhaps happiness is not, after all, the key to our well-being. Let's now consider an alternative approach one that tells us that getting what you want is the measure of a good life. 